Great to see you all. Uh, I am Jackie Gessner. It is great to be here with you. This is kind of a reintroduction somewhat of the Strategic Insights program a little bit. And my first uh, foray into it, I'm an employment lawyer. I work with Food Line Law, which is just around the corner across the street. Um, but I hail from our Indianapolis office. So a, a lot of what I do is help employers navigate all the laws that apply to them when it comes to their relationship with their employees. That can be a lot. That can be a lot of different laws. It's the HR, either responsible people in the room or have to handle the HR responsibilities. No. Um, and unfortunately, when sometimes those become disputed issues, I handle those situations as well. Claims for employees, litigated matters, and the stuff that you hope to never have to call an attorney about, but sometimes does happen. Um, so what I had thought about when I thought, you know, is there a way I can provide some or benefit some help to the Lafayette area businesses and meeting with one of your all's colleagues about it was um, to kind of do an overview, do a basics overview of the key employment law 101 aspects that uh, I see and hear a lot that are even for seasoned HR people sometimes tripped up or forgotten or the rules have changed and to just kind of go over those primary aspects and fold in a little bit of uh, mistakes you know, some top mistakes that I see so that you don't repeat those and can avoid those and don't become one of the, you know, top 10 items that I've filtered throughout here. So what I'm gonna try to do is cover a lot of wage and hour key things, hitting on some of the federal rules. So, you know, we're all in Indiana. I'm gonna tell you the Indiana differences if there are any, uh, but these are gonna apply wherever your employees happen to be. And um, some of the unique stuff that's overlooked the youth labor restrictions, we'll cover those. We'll talk about tips, which there's um, a handful of several key rules that apply to employees' tips, but failing to know one of those, again, can be that thing you have to call me on, so that's never fun. Um, well, come on, feel free to filter in. Uh, we'll talk about some ways about misclassifying workers, how to avoid doing that. I'll talk about a couple general bullet points on I-9 forms, because while those seem very simple, and we all know about them, you can get, again, tripped up and little mistakes can cause for frustration down the road with audits and things like that. So kind of want to get started with the FLSA and talk about what are the key requirements of that law, but then how the exemptions actually work. Because that's where we surround a lot of the bigger issues when we talk about misclassification. One of them is thinking that an employee is fine to be considered a salaried exempt worker, but actually they are not properly classified that way. And so uh, working through ways to understand how do we actually know when I'm classifying an employee correctly or not. So while the FLSA is lengthy, it's got a ton of regulations, I could never stand up here for an hour and tell you all of them, it primarily requires two things. For your non-exempt workers, those are the hourly, manual labor, blue collar workers who are not exempt, which we'll talk about what that means, they have to be paid at least minimum wage, which is $7.25 an hour, and they have to be paid overtime, which is time and a half of their regular rate for any hours that are over 40 in a work week. Employers can set what that work week is, it just has to be a consecutive seven day period, so you can call it Monday you know, at 11 a.m. through Sunday at 10, whatever the related hour would be, you can set that work week, it just has to be that consecutive seven day period. And then anytime that employee works over 40 hours during that work week, whether you told them not to or not, they still gotta be paid that time and a half. So FLSA is extremely broad. I don't even think we need to bother covering whether or not your business is properly covered because almost every business is. That was intended to be the case. You know, that's why they wrote that law that way to protect what at the time was the language they used was blue collar workers. You know, our language around that's kind of changed, but I use it because that's the way the law is written. It talks about blue and white collar workers, and we actually define the exemptions as the white collar exemptions. And that's because that's meant to allow for your, again, non-manual workers to have a different setup, to have a different way in which they're paid, in which their hours don't always stick to a specific clock in and clock out schedule. But maybe sometimes they have to stay late. Maybe sometimes there's not as much going on and they can leave. And by nature of what they do, we're able to continue to pay them that flat predetermined salary amount. So 
those are the tests, but before we kind of dive into what those tests are, just right up the front, mistake number one is failing to properly track your non-exempt workers' hours. That seems overly simplistic, but there's some things that can be done that you think, of course I'm tracking their hours, and make them clock in and out. How could that not be correct? Well, there's some bonus added measures you can have to avoid problems if you're having employees actually check and confirm that their clocked hours are correct. Because a call I get often is, well, this individual is saying that they worked a bunch of overtime, but it's not showing. They don't have any time cards. They're saying that the time was incorrect, that supervisors were telling them to clock out at a time that's before their actual departure time. Or there was something where they had to be called in and failed to clock in or forgot and didn't say anything. So these kind of measures of having just a policy or a requirement or just a practice where you say, hey, check your hours at the end of each week, or at the end of the pay period, verify they're correct, and if not, let me know, and I'll go make that change. And we've avoided a mistake before it's even happened. The other thing is, as you continue to grow, having a timekeeping policy is hugely beneficial that says those things and that tells the employees up front, you need to check your time cards, and we're gonna send them to you in this way, or you can log into the system by using your normal payroll login and make sure everything's correct and do that every Friday or whenever that day might roll that you want to have them verify and check that those are correct. Um, another good thing to put in a policy like that is to require that employees actually have permission before they work overtime. Because another thing where if you're starting out, you're growing your business, you're adding workers, and all of a sudden people are working really hard, hitting that 40 hour mark, going a little bit over it, and you're not realizing well, I've scheduled you to not be working overtime. So I didn't realize the payroll screwed up and we weren't issuing that time and a half. How do I avoid that from happening? We're having a policy and letting folks know, don't work more than 40 hours unless you've got permission or we've asked you to. And if it's coming up to that, you should be letting your supervisor know. Because there's something going on with the schedule, something going on with the workload that we've got to get figured out so that you're not being commanded to work more than you otherwise should have to. So that's sort of our first you know, mistake or just something that's an oversight is failing to track those hours properly. I'm not saying that you're not having people clock in and out, but you're actually paying attention and taking a double step to check to make sure those are accurate. So how do I know who are the employees who need to be paid overtime? Right? Who are the properly exempt employees? And these are the white collar exemptions. There's three things that you have to have for an employee to be an exempt. An exempt is not the same as saying salary, although that's one of the three. But we have kind of have to separate that distinction that we always sort of use salary as interchangeable with exempt, because it's really not. So just focusing on, are they exempt? That means they don't need to be paid overtime. What is that? They have to be paid a minimum salary. That's currently 35,000 and some change over the course of a year lease uh, salary. If they don't make that much, they cannot be exempt. That's just a flat barrier to entry. And that changed two years ago. It used to be lower, and they bumped it up almost about $10,000 different. It was around 23, I guess a little bit over 10,000. 23 and some change, now it's 35 and some change. If you follow any of this news like I do, they're rumoring that they're going to make a change soon. So people don't know what that change would be because there's no proposal out there, but they're speculating that could be another bump in that minimum salary bump. That's probably correct because we have an administration that focuses on workers, wants to expand their protections, and 35,000 a year is not very much money. So um, that's sort of the first barrier to entry. Second requirement is that they have to have a salary pay. Salary means something unique under the FLSA. It doesn't just mean, well, we pay him a salary. Okay, but do you do it in the way the FLSA says you have to do it? You can't just be making lots of changes to their weekly paycheck. You can only make deductions for certain things. And that's because they're meant to be treated as somebody whose work fluctuates. Well, if I work late on Monday because we had an event, and I left early on Friday because it wasn't as busy, you don't get to deduct the time they left early on Friday if they're properly salaried. Salaried means a predetermined amount that doesn't fluctuate 
based on the amount of work that's required. There's some permissible deductions, right? If they're gone for an entire day, you don't perform any work at all. If they're not there for an entire week, you can, of course, deduct for that weekly pay difference. If they're out on leave, you know, it's approved FMLA medical leave, things like that. But there are specific listed out deductions that are permissible, and you can only make those changes to a salaried exempt worker's pay. Um, the third area, so what else? I have to have a minimum salary, I have to be paid on a true salary basis. I also have to have a type of job that fits within the ones that the FLSA, FLSA says are properly treated as exempt. And that's where the white collar exemptions word comes in because these are the duties that exist that, you know, Congress at one point in time when they drafted this law said, okay, how do we separate out non-manual labor that you don't have to pay overtime for? Well, these are the duties. So I'm not gonna go through each one, but I will walk through the two probably most common, most likely to appear in your workforce types of duties that can be exempt. And that's the executive or managerial, sometimes referred to, and the administrative exemption. And this covers a lot of different types of workers. So the first one is, we're talking about your managers. And these have to be people who actually manage. So, you know, day to day, their duties do require the actual management of other employees. It has to be at least two other people that they manage. Um, they can be a manager of the business. They can be the general manager, or they can be a department head. They can lead a division or a team of people. They can even sometimes be supervisors. But they truly do have to have actual day-to-day -day management over at least two people, and they have to have real authority when it comes to that. So the ability to fire people, hire people, the ability to give good input, maybe they're not the final decision maker, but their input will be given great weight. If they say this person needs to go, that's gonna be given a lot of credence. So that's what we say when we talk about your managerial or executive exemptions. The other one is the tricky one that I will tell you gets litigated a lot more is the administrative because this is where our assumptions kind of come in. Well, that's the type of job that's exempt, right? It's not manual work. It's non-manual office work. I work in an area of the business that's supporting the operations or the management of the business, right? I'm not making the widgets, but I work in the finance department, or the HR department, or I run the books, or I'm in charge of general operations, anything that's part of running the business. But the kicker, and the thing that trips a lot of employers up, is you gotta have discretion to make key decisions. You can't just be somebody who is told what to do a day in and day out, and just follows a preset standard on how to do things. So a great example of this is if you take your finance, obviously your chief financial officer is going to be exempt if they make all the decisions about setting the budget, about selecting contractors, you know, deciding what insurance coverage you should choose, how much money we should spend on certain things. They're making true discretionary decisions about key business operations, but if they employ a junior accountant or a bookkeeper underneath them, yes, that person works in an administrative department that supports the business operations, but do they really have discretion to make key business decisions? Or are they just told what to do day in and day out by that leader? So that's the piece on administrative that for a lot of assistant managers or supervisors who don't really have a team under them, don't really have true management authority, it's where they start to lose the ability to fit within one of these duties tests. Now these aren't the only two. There are exemptions for computer professionals, so folks who are actually programming, setting up systems, not help desk. Help desk is falling out of that exemption and they're not making key decisions. They're following standard sets of procedures on how to do things. If X, then Y. Okay, that's all I have to do. So um, there's exemptions under duties for outside salespeople, so people who are regularly away from the office, calling on customers and making sales majority of their time, there's an exemption for that. So there's another one, right? Another duties test that fits those people. There's a, an exemption for professionals. So people who have to go to school, have to have a degree, and use that degree 
in some field of learning, doctors, lawyers, teachers, artists, there's another one for that, right? So I throw these up there as the two most common. So, so you'll probably run into these in wherever your employee takes you. But I think the thing to keep in mind about what is a mistake in this area, obviously misclassification becomes a much bigger problem than you realize. Well, okay, I'll just start paying them overtime. I should have been, but I'll fix it. Well, if the employees identify that you've been misclassifying them, they have a legal claim for that. And that's up to three years back pay for all the overtime they should have received. Imagine the record keeping nightmare that, that creates if you weren't keeping good time records, because then we don't even know truly how many hours did they work over 40. And this becomes added on penalties for failing to pay wages. So now we're talking about the double time of the total amount that was due, double that, and that's an added on penalty. Attorney's fees can come involved when we're in some of these wage and hour laws. So not a fun place to be in, something that it doesn't take an in-depth analysis each time, but as you're hiring people, you need to be thinking about this. Okay, I'm calling you salary exempt, are you? Am I properly treating me that way? So, um, I wanted to talk about youth labor as well because it is something that I'm getting calls on a little bit more, seeing a bit more inquiries from government agencies about uh, youth labor and permits, which there's a change in Indiana law we'll talk about. But it's something that I think is overlooked because we say, well, you know, of course I'm not gonna violate those laws, I'm not employing children, so I'm done, right? Well, it's actually a lot more detailed than that, a lot more restrictions surrounding how much individuals can work who are of the teenage age. So we're talking between the 14 and up to 18 year old individuals. Obviously, federal law and state law prohibit employment of anyone under the age of 14. Some exceptions are out there for working for your parents, babysitting, newspaper delivery, that kind of stuff that you're thinking about. But employed in a job, obviously there's a minimum wage, or excuse me, minimum age requirement. Uh, and the hours restrictions. And this other area where now the agencies that govern these laws, the federal and state departments of labor, are looking into this. And where they have a young person who hurts themselves on the job or believes they're not being paid correctly, now they're looking beyond just the initial issue. It's also, well, let me see the records. When were they working? What were their clock in and clock out times? And I want to see the permit. And I mentioned the permitting because that was in the last, before most recent times, but let's say three to four years ago, around then, getting lots of calls where the agencies are asking for the permits. And no one has any of these on file. It was just routinely tripped up. People were not getting youth permits. And this was a process where through the school or with you know whatever agency, usually it's the school, keeps track, has a permit on file of where that individual's working, what is their schedule, what are their hours, to make sure it's compliant with the rules. So Indiana did realize no one's getting this right. No one is going to the school to get permits. So they did take that requirement away about a year or so ago. But you do have to now register your youth workers. So they have created an online website. Uh, there's monetary penalties for your failure to register your youth workers, so you actually must manually go in and submit those new hires, or if you have any existing youth, go and submit their information, letting this agency know I employ this youth worker. So that's the Indiana's rule. Well, if you've got youth working in other states, you need to make sure there's probably a permitting requirement on file with those state law. So, um, when we're talking about the federal law, between ages of 14 and 16, there's limits on when they can work, whether it's during school time or not. And those restrictions are pretty strict, so you need to make sure the scheduling complies with that. Our change under Indiana law is that they just add some additional rules for the 16 and 17 year olds to allow them to work a little bit longer. But there's still limits. And so where, if there is a unique situation, an individual that falls in those age ranges, has a need or an approved desire to work beyond those, you can attempt to get written parental permission, but again, just remember that while the federal rules apply to the 14 and 15 year olds, Indiana comes in and says, all right, there's rules for the 16 and 17 year olds too, it's broader, 
but you still have to make sure you're not working them outside uh, the hours and schedule restrictions. And that applies to time of day too, right? They can't be working late at night, early morning, depending on their age. Uh, Indiana does have a break rule for teens. So there actually is no state law requiring you to give your employees certain types of breaks in terms of number or length, but for teens, you, you must. For six hours or more in a scheduled uh, you know, shift, they have to be given at least 30 minutes over one or two breaks. You get one 30 minute break or two split however you choose, but that is the requirement to get breaks for your teen workers. Um, so where do employers trip this up again? It's failing to be fit before times register the youth workers uh, or get, excuse me, get a permit, but now it's failing to register those workers. So those are gonna be immediate monetary fines for each failure to register. So tips, uh, this is one that it just, I, I don't think will ever go away in terms of questions I get from clients. It can be complicated. There can be things that I think my clients believe they're doing correctly because it seems fair or right, but it just, when it comes to wage and hour rules, things are just black and white. You either get it right or wrong. And even if you thought, oh, I didn't know that was the rule. I didn't mean to, you know, how can I be liable for all this thousands of dollars in back pay and damages? Oh, there's just no intent exception. You know, it's, it's black and white. Either we got it correct or we didn't, and we're liable when we don't. So tips are wages. It's sort of the most easy thing to remember is, well, I have to make sure my employees receive their wages owed. And when it comes to tips for your tipped workers, those tips are their wages. So employers cannot withhold tips from their employees, ever. You know, those tips that are you know, for a service provided for a tipped employee, that is part of their wages. So, well, but what if I use the you know, tips to buy stuff for my employees? No, it's their wages, we're taking their money, right? Even if you give them you know, Friday lunches and use the tip money for that, or buy them you know, Christmas presents or whatever, violation of the FLSA, you cannot withhold the individual employee's tips. So when we talk about tips, two things to kind of understand the background. And I know some of you maybe are well-versed in these things, but maybe others hadn't really ever thought, well, what do they mean by that? Tip credits. And when we're talking about tipped workers, we mean those who regularly receive at least $20 a month in tips. That's sort of the barrier to entry to be able to use any of these rules. And we're also talking about the times when they're doing tipped work, right? So they're getting tips, waiting tables or they're working with customers receiving tips if they're doing other things but they're on the shift to just clean up or do inventory that's not tipped work so these rules don't apply to that it kicks into the regular standard rules of minimum wage and overtime always applies but so but when we've got tipped employees doing tipped work there's a way to take a tip credit there's a lot of rules that go into that that but uh, tip credit is essentially I can pay the tip credit rate, the lower rate of $2.13 an hour, and I get to take a credit towards the difference between $7.25 and $2.13 for the, for the actual tips they receive. So if the individual employee is receiving at least the difference, then you don't need to pay them more than the $2.13 an hour. That's taking a credit towards that minimum wage requirement. They're still entitled to get $7.25 an hour, but with the cash, tip that we, cash wage that we pay them plus the tips they receive, if that equals 7.25 an hour, we've satisfied the obligation. So that's that requires tracking and record keeping, right? Because if they aren't making any tips that day, we still have to make sure that they're receiving minimum wage. So that's what we mean when we say tip credit. Credit towards the difference <coughs> of being paid 7.25 an hour. Tip pools then are, well, what if we set up an arrangement whereby the tips are put into some sort of shared pot and then divvied up from those employees? Okay, well, there's rules surrounding that, and that's what we call tip pools, or tip splitting. Uh, the first instance of that, and it's not necessarily in this order, but I'll probably give you the most important one where employers really do trip this up. Owners, managers, and supervisors can't get a cut of a tip pool, ever. That will completely screw up, and 
require all the individuals who didn't receive the total allocation they would have, they get a, a valid wage claim. And now we're dealing again with that back pay and those penalties we talked about before. So, oh, what, what if the supervisor waits tables? Are they a true supervisor? Meaning they supervise others, tell them what to do, have some input on discipline, hiring, they get to weigh in on interviews and things like that, can't have a cut. We've ch changed them from you know, a basic entry level worker, given them some supervisory responsibility. They cannot participate in that tip pool. Um, so tip credits, you know, we talked about those, and I mentioned I, I, got, I don't have time to tell you all the ways in which you can have a valid tip credit, but know that that has to be an advanced arrangement with that employee where they have notice of exactly how that tip credit system is going to work. There's a lot of standard things you got to tell them. You got to tell them you're applying a tip credit. You've got to tell them how that tip credit is going to work. You've got to tell them if you're doing a tip pool associated with taking a tip credit. And so just know if you're not having any advanced communication with those tipped workers about a tip credit and how it works, you need to immediately stop, evaluate, and prepare some sort of notification to those employees about how that works. Now, I didn't want to go off the rails and tell you what all those requirements are, but know that that is a requirement. So, uh, what about in terms of tip pooling and where we don't have a tip credit? So, in some circumstances, the rule used to be that only the tipped employees can have a share of the tip pool, right? Does that make sense? If they're doing the work, they're getting the tips. And that was true, except they changed this a couple of years ago to say, well, if everyone's getting the 725, meaning we don't take any tip credits, the tip pool is just kind of an on top add on, you can include the non tipped employees, not supervisors, managers, or owners, but everyone else that's supporting those people, right? And that's fair too, because we're talking about the people in the back, the kitchen staff, the cleaners, the people who are doing the work that we believe that they should be allowed to share in the tip pool. If you're not taking a tip credit, that's now permissible. But again, never supervisors and managers. Um, you've got to redistribute those tips. If you're the employer you know, managing the tip pool, which you should be, uh, you've got to redistribute those within the pay period. So if you've got also credit card transactions going on and some of the tips are applied to that, and you think, well, I'll just wait until we get reimbursed. We actually have the cash in from running all those credit card transactions. If that puts you outside the pay period, you're violating the FLSA. So these employees, again, tips are wages. Wages gotta be paid within a certain time, and so these need to go on that next regular pay period. All record keeping applies to basically every touch of this tip process. So you need to have tipped employees, again, who get at least $20 a month in tips. They need to be reporting any cash tips that you don't otherwise have a way to track. They should be reporting that to you. This is routinely not done, especially in a lot of service industries. That creates a problem for your tax obligations, for their tax obligations, and uh, specifically, it's an IRS rule that says, well, the employees need to be reporting those amounts to you so you can factor that in their income and properly record and report those tips. So I stressed it before, but another mistake that, again, employers often just don't know that this is the rule, but supervisors can't be in that tip pool. That's a big one that, and it's really a hard conversation with my clients, which is where, well, these, they're helping. They're sweeping the floor and they're busting tables. Okay, but did you actually give them supervisory authority? And I can't. Can't change the rule, it is what it is. You know, we've then got to fix that problem. And then failing to keep those records. Where these situations come up, maybe you didn't do anything wrong, but if we hadn't had records of how we properly were divvying up the tip pool and making sure everyone got their fair cut, how do I prove that? You know, you need to have, because the rules require you to have maintain the records and keep them, but we're also then going to run bigger problems. If we want to be able to defend we did it right those records need to be maintained and kept. So, it's kind of my overview of the tip rules, um, highlights about some of the most significant things. Um, we talked about classification earlier when it comes to the FLSA and exemptions. 
That word is applied also, though, to defining correctly who is our W-2 employee and who is a true contractor. Now, why is this such a big deal? Because it touches almost everything I do, almost every protection that I get called to answer questions about for an employee, a true employee, only applies to those who are employees, right? So anti-discrimination laws and all the civil rights laws, all the wage and hour laws we talk about, uh, tax requirements, obviously paying your payroll taxes and extending paid benefits to employees for employees who are full-time and entitled to your, all of your paid benefits, all of that only applies to your employees, right? You're not putting your contractors on your payroll and you're not giving them health insurance. But how do we know we've done that correctly? Well, this is a big problematic area that a number of government agencies get their fingers in because of, imagine all the ones I just listed off, IRS, EEOC, Department of Labor. They all realize, well, an employer, if they want to avoid our requirements, they just call them contractors. They're not employees, so they're outside the realm of these protections. But then each of those agencies decided, well, there's got to be a way, a test that we control this because there's violations happening here. And if these people otherwise should have been treated as employees and are just called a contractor, well, then the protections should have applied. And let's go back and take a look back at things that should have been done differently. Um, it's very important to properly classify, and when we say this, we're talking about who are we designating as a contractor. And there's a ton of tasks, I just mentioned, there's a lot of agencies get their fingers in this, but to kind of summarize, what are the key things that all these different tests will look at? The most important thing is control. Who has the control over the job? And that control reflects on the way the job is performed, where it's performed, when it's performed, what tools do I use to perform it, decisions do I make to complete my job, that control over all those things, if it's within the realm of the employer, I'll decide what your schedule is, when you have to come here, what you're gonna do while you're doing the job, how you're gonna do it, and all those other things that I wanna have control over as the employer, well, that's an employee. You've taken the control. If the individual has the right to say, well, I'll be there at this time, I'll get the work done by three months from now, and I'll never have to tell you or agree with you on how I get it done, all I have to tell you and promise you is I'll get it done. We're now talking about an independent contractor, an individual, right, having that control and deciding what they're going to do when it comes to the manner and the means of the work. There are some other things that are ancillary to that, but that's the most important question. The side things, the things that also start to fall into one or the other, how are they paid? Are they paid an hourly rate or a salary for over the course of a year? Or are they paid $5,000 if you complete this project and complete it within three months? Are they the person who has to buy all the tools to do the job? Think of you know true contractors that you hire out, come and hang my drywall or fix my roof, I'm not gonna buy you your tools or pay for your tools to do the job, but an employee's not on the hook for their cell phone and their laptop and all the other expenses that go into doing their job. Again, different control, but another piece about who's paying for the expenses, who's paying for the tools of the trade. Uh, is the work part of the integral nature of the business? Right, so come and install the flooring in our conference space at our, you know, uh, Greater Lafayette Commerce, you know, business services organization. The flooring is not integral to your business. This is something where somebody who maybe has a skill or a trade or is a professional of some kind, a contractor, comes and performs that work. So again, kind of other little pieces to this, biggest one being control. And where do employers kind of most likely make mistakes about this? A couple of just sort of problem areas where I've seen is just designating everyone as a contractor. You know, just deciding when you're growing your new business or starting out realizing, oh, I can save a lot of money 
and avoid a lot of regulation and requirements if I just call everyone a contractor. Great, I'll do that. Well, obviously there's a reason everyone can't just do that. Uh, so that should give you a pause. I'm, I may not be doing this correctly. I may be misclassifying my true employees by just calling everyone a contractor. Switching from one to the other, where the role stays the same, is something where, uh, better take a pause. If they were an employee at one point, what are we doing that changes their role, that loosens some of the control we had, or that changes the setup of the payment, the expenses, what it is they're doing, that really does make that change, a true change to a contractor. Uh, where you've got people who work alongside one another and are performing the same job, and one of them's an employee and one of them's a contractor, that's a red flag in my world. If you called me to say, eh, we were talking about that classification thing, and we've got two people who sit, you know, they share a wall and they sit right across from another and they basically do all the same jobs. One of them's a contractor though because that's how we set them up. And that's okay, right? How much control do you have over the person? You know, the other thing to think about is it doesn't drive the question or the decision making what you call them. It does not drive the decision of whether or not they're a contractor if you pay them on a 1099. It does not matter to the government agency's eyes whether or not you had a contract that said you are a contractor. None of that matters. They'll be wanting to know who has the control? How is the pay set up? Is this person someone with a skill or a trade? You know, what, what job are they coming in to do? Those are the questions that will be asked. So um, these kind of you know, areas where you can kind of see, oh, that's where if a government agency is called, they're going to take a closer look. And we've got to go back to these questions to say, ah, OK, I think we might not be classifying this person correctly. And oh, they would be not exempt, and they are out overtime and all these other things that go into it. So mis misclassification of the contractors is the other mistake area, problematic area, that comes with a lot of liability, right? Because think about all those things I just mentioned on the look back. The IRS, we owe them money. They don't like when you don't follow their rules, so they'll, they'll add some penalties to that if you were to be audited. We've got wage and hour issues. Again, if that individual should have been non-exempt and worked over 40 hours, and we were just calling a contractor and paid them X flat amount, and that flat amount did not equate to what they should have received had they gotten 725 plus overtime. Uh, benefits as well. This is where, you know, in, in a contractor agreement, you can try to help limit this, but if the individual otherwise would have qualified for your employee benefits and should have been classified as an employee, actually owe them the back cost if we misclassify them, for the cost of those paid benefits. So think about the health insurance and other things that they you know, would have had to pay out of pocket for. And potentially then, maybe there was situations that happened that incurred some costs. Had they had benefit coverage, would have been different. So a uh, big headache, a problematic situation, something to always be thinking about as you're bringing on new workers figuring out how to classify them when it comes to, are they an employee? Do we need to get them on the payroll? How do we need to classify them as an employee? But also uh, looking at your contractors with that same eye. Uh, let's talk about I-9s. So I mentioned this because um, I actually have had situations where lots of employers uh, find problematic areas when they either perform their own routine audits uh, or potentially they're the unfortunate person who gets plucked on a random audit and discovers that their I-9 process was not great and for each little error starts adding up the penalties that will be issued for even just paperwork errors. So I-9s, obviously we're talking about everyone in this room, no matter your industry, or no matter how many employees you have or how many locations, every new employee must have an I-9 completed, and that must be on file. Um, the, the purpose of this, you know, this was around the mid-80s, came along because people were worried about people working illegally, and included a lot of other things that go along with this. The point of the form is to verify that the person is eligible to work, and that they are who they say they are, based on those identifications they're providing. So, 
the law wrapped in a lot of other things that employers have to do, which is obviously they can't hire unauthorized workers, but you also can't fail to fill out the form or knowingly look away when appearances appear to be different, the forms that you're, the identification you're given does not appear to be valid, um, taking false documents knowingly to fill out the form. These are the things that, again, can cause company violations for, again, failing to fill out that form and maintaining that for each employee. So uh, we're talking about a time component to this too. While the form says this, sometimes my clients or if you're new to having a complete personal paperwork, you think, ah, maybe that's a suggestion, but the time requirement will go into whether or not you properly fill out the form. The employee's part, section one, where they write down their information, right, and verify their own ability to work, that's gotta be the first day that they work for you. First day of employment, right, so what's their hire date? They have to complete that section one first thing. Your job to complete the second part, where you've verified the documents and that they are who they say they are, within three business days of that day. So, if you were pulled for a random audit and or you did your own compliance audit to check and it appeared that the dates don't match, we have our authorized person signing two weeks later, ding, we didn't fill out the form correctly. And there's monetary penalties associated with just not doing the paperwork right. So. These things, again, have to be done on a timely basis. Yeah, question, go for it. What if you do the self-audit and you discover, oopsie poopsie, I missed a day? So we can certainly have the ability to make corrections because that's showing good faith. That's one of the things that the agency is going to look at. All right, well, if you notice that this happened on one occasion, we can make a correction. We can update the form, make a note. Um, provided that you then also demonstrate, you look to see, is this a universal problem? Did we routinely just put these on a stack and have them signed two weeks later? You need to have realized it's not just a one-off and demonstrate your efforts to correct that practice. I would, if I was in that shoes, do an office memo to managers. Update on correct ways of filling out the I-9 form. Everyone should be aware if you're the person tasked with completing that form, and then save that memo, right? File that thing away as, oh, I found an error, and here's my good faith measures that I took to fix it. So um, copying the identification, everyone does this, and that's great best practice, because then you are able to, when we find things are missing or not filled out correctly, we can then go back to that copy we made of that person's identification and make a, a correction. You don't legally have to make copies, but that's a really good compliance measure to have. So I do advise continue to do that, right? To maintain those copies of the IDs and keep them with the forms. Super, super helpful when you are doing your own compliance audit to be able to find a way to make a correction if you can. Um, I was under the impression from the previous roles that you're not supposed to keep their identification copies. You can. There's no restriction that says you cannot. It's just that you aren't legally required to do it. So, you know, the Immigration Reform and Control Act says that nothing about maintaining a copy is required. Um, I would keep it with the I-9 forms, though. So, what about retention? Obviously, we need these things. Where does someone come knocking and want to copy of them? Obviously, you need to have it for the entire time that person works there. And then there's a post-employment period. It's kind of complicated, but it's essentially just that you either have maintained that for at least uh, three years after they're hired or a year after they left. So sometimes one or the other can be longer, and you have to keep the longer period of time. Just ensure these things are maintained throughout their employment and that you've got a strong record retention measure not to destroy post-employment records quickly upon separation of that there's a lot of other things that will go into that. So other mistake then, failing to retain these, right? Because you're gonna need these. If you wanna do your own, let's check to make sure, or again, provided that you are subject to an audit, you've got it all ready to go, and all your records were kept, because like I said, these are monetary penalties. So what, what are we talking? Well, it's per violation uh, for an individual, 
and it's a range, 200 some dollars to over $2,000, how are they gonna set the amount? They're gonna look at how big you are, how big's your company budget, how egregious was the error? Are you hiring an individual with false identification or not really completing the form, trying to not have to write down what appeared to be false identification? Are you a routine violator? So when they looked at it, did you screw up on everyone, everyone's form or was it just one or two off? Those are the things that are gonna kind of weigh how much are we gonna impose a penalty for and good faith measures. That's the other thing, it's gonna help you bring down a penalty if you did make a mistake, then the agency's gonna look at that and say, all right, well, we're not trying to put people out of business. We just need them to make sure they're complying with the law. Um, I note that I never like to do shock or scare you know, my clients, but I just like to note that there's a component to this that adds a criminal measure, and no one in this room would ever knowingly, fraudulently fill out a form or fail to collect proper identification for new hires. But you know, this doesn't just impose paperwork fines. There's a, a criminal uh, component that applies to the individuals responsible for making sure the form is completed. Again, if they're hiring people without uh, knowingly checking those identifications, um, doing so knowing that the IDs are false, or you know things that impose greater greater penalties when we're talking about police protection. So I know this mistake is um, not conducting your own compliance audits because there's a lot of paperwork to this, right? So I could list any number of little things. Oh, you know, failing to sign within three days, but. I really think the best practice measure is, when's the last time, or if ever, have you done any of your own I-9 audits? And this doesn't need to be monthly. You know, this is a occasional, sporadic, you know, maybe annual or less thing that you do, um, but allowing yourself to catch where there's an error, again, is you, can, you ask the question, we can then demonstrate how do we correct? How do we ensure we're not repeating the error? And that can help in the long run. So I've got you for seven more minutes, which is perfect. It's just enough time to kind of cover a little bit about non-competes. Um, you know, I thought about the mix of who would be here. You represent different industries and sizes, and maybe you run the business yourself, or maybe you're looking to hopefully hire a manager and shift some of that responsibility off. But non-competes, I think, kind of hit for a lot of different types of employers and has been talked about more so recently. Um, you know, this is where we're talking about ag agreements that we have with individuals that we hire to limit what they can do after they leave us, and of course during the time they're with us, to not turn around and compete or work directly with a competitor in a certain region, um, to not solicit our customers, call on our clients, um, to not solicit our employees, to not turn around and try and start your own gig down the street hang your own shing shingle, and then recruit all of your former coworkers. So there's a lot of things that go into non-competes. Sometimes we, we actually refer to them as restrictive covenants because it's not just don't compete, it's don't call on our customers, don't try to hire our employees or former coworkers. Um, but this isn't really a state-driven um, set of laws. Indiana doesn't have a direct statute, but they've got rules that the courts have kind of created over time to say, when is this thing not permissible? When are you going too far, employer? Because this is imposing a restriction on what a person can do, their means of, of earning a living. So we can't look at it just as, it's a contract. You know, they can do whatever you want. The courts definitely come in and say, this has gotta be reasonable. And you can't go without the bounds of reason to limit what a person can do after they leave their employ. So, the asterisk on that state specific, I'll get into it, because there's a little bit of a news going around if you haven't paying attention, but um, before I do, essentially what reasonable means is, well, how do I make sure non-competes are reasonable? We're talking about how far do they go? Are you saying the person can never work in the industry ever anywhere again? Probably too broad, right? You've gotta have within the area where you had them working, or within the areas where the customers were, you had them working with, or you've got a time limit to this. You know, this thing's gonna expire a year after you've gone, or two years after you've gone, and not 
five or 10 years after. That's, again, looking at it as unreasonable because it's just too broad. So, well, I mentioned Indiana doesn't have a statute on this, and states are the ones that get their hands in this. So, depending on where you're employing the person, maybe a different set of rules, but more recently, this long ago mention of maybe we should get on this on the federal level, it was 2021 when it was first mentioned that hey, maybe we should get the FTC to make a rule about this and limit non-competes. And then that thing sat until uh, just a few months ago. Now they've proposed a rule to ban non-competes at the federal level. It's an actual proposal, so it starts the rulemaking process. Um, there's going to be a lot of debate surrounding it. Will that actually pass? What's your gambling bet on that? I mean, I'm skeptical that it will ever go through to the point of getting through a legal challenge, right? Where they'd actually pass a federal ban on non-competes. There's going to be so much challenge from the individual rights to contract, right? To enter into an agreement that you desire to and that both parties agree to. So it's gonna be a lot of debate, but just know that that's kind of going on in the background. I'm not uh, holding my breath. You know, it just sort of started that process. Federal rulemaking can become the extension of deadlines train, right? So again, that's just sort of something to keep in mind and know, but where the states get involved and some examples of what that looks like, uh, I know we're not in these places, but just to sort of let you know, the trend is going towards protecting low wage workers. So some statutes actually say, you cannot enter into a non-compete employer if you're individually you're trying to restrict earns less than this much money. And that kind of makes sense, right? Somebody who's, um, their trade is them performing the work that they do and they receive an hourly rate for it or they're not somebody making the secret sauce or designing up your engineering, you know, drawings and instead they're just, I need to be able to work in the area I live and do the trade that I kind of learned. That's where a lot of these states are getting involved. They're also imposing, in some instances, a requirement that the employee gets advance notice and a guaranteed period of time to review that agreement before they must have to sign it. Not within the setting on day one, sign all this paperwork. So some states are actually saying, hey, you gotta give them this at least two weeks ahead of time. Send it with the offer letter and you can't require that they do this faster. They should be able to get to review this. And I think this is interesting because you know, I just throw up all these, this is the number of states that actually have said, we're gonna pass a law on this. We're gonna say what it means to have a reasonable non-compete in our state. And you can imagine then, if you're growing and crossing state lines and have what you believe is the contract you like to use all the time with workers in a certain job or position, and all of a sudden, well, wait a minute, we just went over into Illinois, our neighbor, they've got strict limitations on non-competes. We need to be aware of that. Otherwise, what you thought would be a really important protection that you have for somebody who's a key employee, um, that, that contract that's signed by them can be deemed void just because it didn't comply with that particular state statute. So another mistake I threw out there that I see is just using a, a form or a template non-compete downloaded from a website and copied the language and put it into the offer letter or just created your own version because no one's then looking, but well, wait a minute, am I in a place or this, is this an employee in a place where they're entitled to get 14 days notice of this? And actually, do they not get paid enough to have to be required to sign this? And does it really do what we want it to do? And that's the other thing is a lot of times we're just trying to get all this paperwork complete and the agreement doesn't actually say what we need it to. And that's a big, common uh, problem of the downloading and copy pasting. and You don't know the person that put that out there actually didn't make a mistake in it. And it's a nonsensical sentence and we're left with it. So that's kind of, oh, I love when I can actually hit the mark. Um, kind of my overview of top areas that get tripped up, things that can be helpful to you know have awareness of going into things so that we can get them done correctly. but. I'm happy to take any questions, thoughts, comments you guys have on anything or other things. 
Um, you mentioned at the beginning about having employees check their list of hours and con confirming that as part of a policy or practice. Mm -hmm. um, is Other than just that kind of being a good idea, because then both parties can have some accountability, uh, is that then if they come back and say, hey, you didn't pay me for weeks X, Y, and Z, um, and I say, well, you didn't, you didn't check those weeks, so... Yes. Rocks. Can we can we use that, right? Is that a helpful argument? Yeah. Absolutely. Because the records, the timekeeping records, carry greater weight in a wage dispute if we actually have a good timekeeping and record keeping practice. If we don't follow good timekeeping practices and or we oops, we just screwed up and for some reason we lost those time sheets. Or I don't know how much they worked because the records are missing, then it becomes this Oh, is he said, she said, and we don't have a good way to overcome it, and we lose a lot of the strong argument position that we have, when if we just had the, here are the valid time records for you, and oh, by the way, you clicking the box each time, or signing off each payroll period, you said it was correct, so you have to prove that this is wrong. I don't have to. It's extremely helpful, and it's your number one saving grace in a, in a wage dispute is accurate time records and that we retain those suckers. <laughs> Anything else? Thoughts? Comments? Speculations on whether Biden will actually pass a non-compete ban that <laughs> nobody can sign non-competes? Yeah, she shouldn't have had. No, I don't think so either. It's tough to get things done in Congress and even if the states the states always have to have led the trend, right? Those needs to be a majority of states already done this. And even then, it's just a slow grind. I think there's just too many exceptions. Yeah, well, and too many different types of positions right. where we've established this is, this is the standard. You know, there's a lot of statutes that specifically apply to physicians as well to say, well, what happens when they leave? Because we're talking about the patient's ability to choose where they go, then the doctors need the records should they choose to go somewhere else. And so there's statutes that specifically, including in Indiana, say what happens when a physician leaves and how can you impose a non-compete um, on that physician. So a lot of, as you, as you point out, unique circumstances. Well, I've been pleased to be with you guys today. Hopefully have a great afternoon and close out to the week. Uh, we chatted briefly about a survey, but I just encourage you to, if you liked the content <coughs> of the topic, or if you'd like to hear more about this kind of area, shoot a note to Kirsten, and I'll know that that means maybe I should come back, um, come up with other content for you all. So thank you for being here today.